Today on Reparations in Action. The Minnesota Department of Human Rights released a report recently exposing how the Minneapolis Police Department engages in, quote, the illegal practice of race discrimination in violation of the Minnesota Human Rights Act. You're listening to Reparations in Action. Uhuru. You're listening to the White Lies Shattered podcast and FM radio show. My name is Jamie Simpson, and I am the host of White Lies Shattered, which broadcasts weekly on Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. White Lies Shattered, also known as Reparations in Action, is a program of white solidarity with Black Power. Currently, we are in a podcast series exposing the insidious lies we learn as white or European people about the nature and origin of America and the current social system. We believe reparations to African people is the key question of our times and is one that demands action on the part of European or white people. As always, we'd like to salute Black Power 96, where this show is aired and recorded for our podcast weekly. Black Power 96 is a radio station that is not just explaining the world, but changing it. You can get the app for Black Power 96 on Google Play or the Apple App Store and listen wherever you are located. Today, we are joined by Leah Fifield, a member of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Jesse Neville, National Chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement based in St. Louis, Missouri, for a discussion about colonialism and resistance in Minneapolis, Minnesota, historically and today. Today, we aim to shatter the lie that Minneapolis is a progressive beacon, Leah and the Uhuru Solidarity Movement Committee in Minneapolis recently wrapped up a successful organizing tour to build solidarity with African liberation in this city. Jesse, you just got back from Minneapolis where you and Hallie Murray, along with members of the African People's Socialist Party, participated in an organizing tour. Why is it so important for the Uhuru Solidarity Movement to be in Minneapolis? Uhuru, Jamie, and Leah... It's really great to be on White Lies Shattered as always. And I want to, first of all, appreciate Chairman Omalia Shatella and the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. And for anyone who's listening to this podcast for the first time, the organization that I'm a part of, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, is the organization of white people formed by and working under the leadership of Chairman Omalia Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party with the assignment of going back into the white community and winning white people to the stand of solidarity with African liberation and unity through reparations to African people. And everything that I understand, everything that we understand in the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, we understand because we learned it from the leadership of Chairman Amalia Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party and Deputy Chair Ona Zanea Shatella and the political theory and worldview of African internationalism, the theory that guides the work of this movement and which enables us as white people, as colonizers, sitting on the pedestal of the oppression and genocide of African and indigenous people to see the world through their eyes, which is another way of saying to see the truth. And that's why we do this show, White Lies Shattered. And I also want to acknowledge Penny Hess, the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, who is usually on the program with us every single week and just brings so much to this uh, podcast as the chair of APSC, having worked under the leadership of Chairman Amali Shatella for over 46 years, and who also wrote the book, Overturning the Culture of Violence, which in so many ways is the inspiration for this podcast and this series. And I'm excited and and. I think it's very important to talk about the history of the significance of of Minneapolis, Um, because we are approaching May 25th, 2022, two years since the murder of George Floyd. And it is important for us to look not only at the conditions that led to the incredible righteous African resistance, the rebellions that happened in Minneapolis uh, in May and June of 2020, and that swept the whole world. But to look at the the history of this city overall, going back to its inception, 
And right now, as you mentioned, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement is actively building and organizing on the ground in Minneapolis, recruiting under the leadership of comrades like Leah and Lisa and others that we'll be talking with today. Um, but we feel like it's really, really important because, you know, Minneapolis is one of those places that often is selected for lists in bourgeois media publications that promote like the top 10 cities for people to live. And really what that, it should say in parentheses, top 10 cities for white people to live. And it promotes a kind of lifestyle, uh, this sort of progressive illusion of multiculturalism and diversity and progressive values. But the reality of the situation is quite different. The history of Minneapolis and Minnesota overall is no different from the history of the United States itself, just like St. Louis, where I'm located, just like New York, just like St. Petersburg, Florida, where Jamie is located. This entire country was built on the enslavement of African people and the genocide against the indigenous people and colonialism around the world, <clears throat> as Chairman Amali Shatella and African internationalism teaches us, that this social system was built through and continues to be sustained by what Chairman Omali Shatella has called a colonial mode of production. A colonial mode of production meaning that everything we have access to, all goods and services, all resources, even our own image of ourselves, our own identity and how we understand the world requires suffering and exploitation of African people, their labor, their land, their resources, and that all of the prosperity and well-being that we take for granted as white people requires this, this misery and this violence against African and indigenous people. And Minnesota is no exception. This is a place that has been the site of some of history's most vicious acts of colonial genocide and terror against indigenous people and African people. It's the place where the largest mass lynching in U.S. history took place in uh, Mankato in 1862, sanctioned by none other than the so-called great emancipator, U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, December 26, 1862, 38 indigenous men were lynched and hundreds of white people from Minnesota came from miles around to watch and make a full day out of watching the, most, the largest mass lynching in U.S. history. And what brought this about was just the continued attacks by the U.S. government against the indigenous people in the process of stealing their land and committing genocide against them and making them empty promises um, in the form of so-called treaties. And that the authorities in Minnesota had asked Lincoln to order the immediate execution of actually over 300 indigenous men who were accused of having, who were, who were noted for having been involved in anti-colonial resistance to the white colonial settlers. And, uh, and Lincoln ended up presiding over the execution of 38 of those indigenous people. And the rest of them were forced into a concentration camp um, in that was referred to as the Fort Snelling concentration camp. And we were looking at some quotes of exchanges between the correspondences between the general who was involved in that mass lynching, as well as the governor of Minnesota at the time, and the president, Abraham Lincoln himself. And uh, they were very explicit that their goal, their mission was, quote, the Sioux Indians of Minnesota must be exterminated or driven forever beyond the borders of the state. And the treatment of the indigenous people, including the hanging in Mankato and the forced removal of Dakota people from Minnesota, were the first phases of that plan. And the plan was further implemented when bounties were placed on the scalps of indigenous people, eventually reaching $200 per scalp collected by white colonial settlers and punitive expeditions that were sent out over the next few years to hunt down the indigenous people who had not surrendered and to force the indigenous people into concentration camps through the winter of 1862 and 63. And in April 
1863, the remaining condemned men, along, indigenous men, along with the survivors of the Fort Snelling con concentration camp, were forcibly removed from their homeland and placed on boats, transporting them from Moncato to Davenport, Iowa, where they were imprisoned for an additional three years. Those from Fort Snelling were shipped down the Mississippi River to St. Louis and then up the Missouri River to the Crow Creek Reservation in South Dakota. And that was in 1862, 1863. So um, in 1920, another incredibly horrific and heinous and notorious lynching took place in Minnesota, this time in Duluth, Minnesota. And that's about two hours north of Minneapolis. And this was the, a lynching, a public lynching of African people, which was happening at that time all over the country. Thousands and thousands of African men, women, and children who were rounded up and, and slaughtered and tortured and raped in broad daylight by massive groups of white people uh, throughout that time period when African people were coming back from the first imperialist war and were, were organizing and fighting for their liberation and, and to defend themselves and their families. That was a time of the Marcus Garvey movement and so much of that kind of activity at that time. And what happened in Duluth, Minnesota, was that on June 14th, 1920, the circus had come to town and hundreds of African people had been hired to be exploited as day laborers to cook for the circus workers. And as happened in so many different places throughout this country, two white women lied and accused three African men of sexual assault. The Duluth police chief, John Murphy, rounded up 100 African people who had been hired to work for the circus, lined them up for the white women to identify them. And they identified six African men who were arrested and taken to the Duluth city jail. And, um, you know, of course, this was all just something that was happening all the time, where on these kinds of accusations, African people were being, uh, were being attacked in this vicious way. And just like in St. Petersburg, Florida, with the, the killing of John Evans, the lynching of John Evans in 1914, the African men were brought to a jail and the news began to spread throughout the white population of Duluth and 5,000 white people uh, raced towards the jail and broke, uh, forced their way in and broke them, these African men out of the jail cells and took, basically took it into their own hands as an extension of the white colonial state. They uh, tortured these Africans. They held a mock trial and found these African men, quote unquote, guilty, beat them, dragged them up to the town square and hanged them. And there are some incredibly um, just horrible photos that you can see online if you search the, the Duluth lynching. And these were photos that the people involved in the lynching took to, to celebrate and remember and be able to look back nostalgically on what they had done. You can see them smiling. You can see people moving to squeeze, squeeze themselves into the shot. And that picture became a postcard keepsake. And of course, uh, no white person was ever convicted for, for that lynching. So these are just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more history that we could look at, but it's, it's no different from anything else in this country. Uh, as we understand from the leadership of Chairman Amali Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party, that this kind of violence is necessary to maintain a colonial mode of production in which the foundation of white wealth and a so-called progressive lifestyle for white people in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, and the U.S. is fueled by bloodshed and stolen land and resources. Wow. Uh, thank you so much for that overview, Jesse. Um, every inch of this land is just soaked in blood of African and indigenous people. And then we just keep revealing that on, on White Lies Shattered. Uh, I want to bring on now Leah Fifield, who also joins us, who we're, we're very glad to have on the show today, who for the past several years has been organizing with Uhura Solidarity Movement or USM 
in Minneapolis, along with Lisa Watson, longtime member of the African People's Solidarity Committee, or APSC, and other comrades there. USM in Minneapolis has held a march for reparations, rallies, outreach tables, studies, meetings, events, fundraisers, and more to build solidarity from the white community with the anti-colonial struggle of African people for liberation and reparations. Leah, you were born and raised in Minneapolis. How did you come to uh, understand the truth about your hometown and what brought you into the movement for reparations to African people? Uhuru, Jamie, and Uhuru, Jesse. Um, first, I do want to say that I am very excited to join you today on Reparations in Action, which is my favorite podcast. I, I just have to say that because I do learn so much every time I listen to the podcast. And, you know, that's because of how clearly the Reparations in Action team exposes the lies that we as white people are taught and are brought up with and tell ourselves and repeat over and over and over. So I just want to thank you for inviting me to join you today. Um, back in 2017, I was taking a class and the instructor was an African woman who directed all the white people in the class to figure out how to pay ongoing reparations. And she said that this is something that we should be working into our monthly budget. This is just something you should be doing on an ongoing basis. So this made a lot of sense to me. And because of this, I sought out my childhood friend, Lisa Watson, who I knew was involved in an organization whose work was centered on winning reparations. And Je um, Jamie, as you just stated, Lisa is a longtime member of the African People's Solidarity Committee and has been involved in working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party since she graduated from college. So Lisa is a tremendous resource for Uhuru Solidarity Movement members living in Minneapolis. Lisa and I began to meet for study sessions, and I learned more about reparations and what that means as defined by the African People's Socialist Party. Um, we also talked more about the historic 1982 reparations tribunal that was held by the party and the chairman's struggle to make reparations a household word. As I learned more about the African People's Socialist Party and the amazing history behind the party's struggle against colonial capitalism and the colonial mode of production, it became very clear to me that this was a struggle with which I wanted to be really actively involved. So I asked Lisa how I could get more involved, and she said, your next steps are to join USM, become a member, and then you can look into doing things like taking the Reparations Challenge, which is a campaign of USM in which white people are challenged to utilize their creativity and skills to raise reparations to fund the Black Power Blueprint. So I sat down and thought about, like, what are my skills? What am I able to, um, how, how can I raise reparations? And so I decided for my reparations challenge, I wanted to offer acupuncture and body work. Those are things that I'm trained in. And all of the funds raised by these sessions would go directly to the Black Power Blueprint. So this has been a really incredible way to engage my own white community on the topic of reparations and how we need to be part of building the culture of white reparations to African people, which is what the party calls on us to do. So I am very honored to be working under the leadership of the party and have come to understand that the only principled stance that white people can take is to be working under the leadership of oppressed and colonized peoples. And USM is the only organization out there created specifically for white people that is working under the leadership of the African working class. So as for how I learned the truth about my hometown, it really wasn't until I became a member of USM and began learning more about the colonial mode of production that I came to understand that the foundation of a happy and healthy life for white people, including myself in Minneapolis and any other city in the US is predicated on the suffering of indigenous African and colonized people. So you can't truly call a city progressive or forward thinking if the comfort of white people is predicated on the suffering of colonized people. And as much as we in the white community want to paint our city of Minneapolis as this really warm, welcoming, and peaceful place, 
the daily experience of African, Indigenous, and colonized peoples is dramatically different from what the white community experiences. Wow. Thank you for laying all of that out. Can you also talk to us about what what conditions uh, the African and colonized people in Minneapolis face today? Yes, absolutely. Minneapolis is seen as this bastion of progressive values in the upper Midwest. You might remember news reports in 2020 after the police murder of George Floyd that talked about how a number of our city council members called for defunding and dismantling of the police department, which did not happen, and our police budget has just increased since then. Um, however, there, there's certainly a population of people in Minneapolis who are looking critically at police and policing. Historically, we have elected what some people would call progressive Democrats like Paul Wellstone. We have a Green Party member in our city council. There are several Democratic socialists who have run for office and won. You know, unions have a strong presence here. There's a number of cooperatively and collectively run businesses and housing units in Minneapolis. There's a strong art and music community here. Um, as mentioned previously, um, you know, we always make top 10 lists. We are known as the city with the best bicycle infrastructure, and we have a large biking community here. So that's definitely looked on as something that's very progressive. Um, we are known as being the land of 10,000 lakes. So we have lakes, rivers, creeks, forests that are part of our city landscape. And related to lakes, um, recently there was a campaign to rename what used to be called Lake Calhoun, which is the largest lake in the center of South Minneapolis. And South Minneapolis is the predominantly white part of Minneapolis. The lake was originally named for John C. Calhoun, who was the seventh vice president of the United States from 1825 to 1832. And he was an adamant defender of slavery and of protecting the interests of the white colonizer population of the U.S. So this lake was renamed, or as some say, it was returned to its original name of Bidet Makaska, which is, is a Dakota word that means white earth lake. This is definitely something many white people point to when espousing the so-called progressive nature of our city, that we were able to you know, um, change this lake's name into um, its original name of Bidet Makaska. So there's a lot of young white people who move here from neighboring states to go to one of our many colleges and universities, and oftentimes they end up staying in Minneapolis because white people are afforded a very high quality of life here. However, when we white people take our blindfolds off and look at the daily reality of colonized people here in Minneapolis, we learn that the city has some of the worst disparities in the entire country. In 2018, the median African income, median African family income in Minneapolis was $36,000 according to Census Bureau data. A typical white family in the city earned $83,000. So this $47,000 difference is one of the largest income gaps in the nation. In percentage terms, the typical African household earns only 44% as much as the typical white one. And of the nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas, only Milwaukee, which is just in our um, neighboring state of, state of Wisconsin, has a larger gap between African and white earnings. And approximately one quarter of African families in Minneapolis own their home, which is the lowest Black ownership home ownership rates in the United States. Minneapolis white families, by contrast, have one of the nation's highest rates at 76%. So this resultant gap works out to more than 50 percentage points. And there are only two other cities in the country that have larger home ownership disparities. And this home ownership disparity is due to racial covenants in which real estate transactions in many Minneapolis neighborhoods were bound by provisions that limited ownership to white families in the 20th century. As racially restrictive deeds spread, Africans were pushed into a few small areas of the city. And even as the number of African residents continued to climb throughout Minneapolis, there were ever larger swaths of the city that became entirely white. They could only be 
um, white people could own houses in these larger and larger portions of the city. And this is colonialism. This is the oppression of one group of people for the benefit of the oppressor group. And in this case, the entire African population was being forced to live in particular parts of the city, which creates the pedestal upon which the white population lives and allows us to enjoy a high quality of life. So our neighboring city of St. Paul, that's just right across the Mississippi River, um, African communities there have also long faced colonial violence in many forms, including gentrification. In the 1950s and 60s, which is a time in our history that as white people, we look back to that time as being really idyllic and full of progress. And, you know, there was the rise of the middle class and all of these lies that we tell ourselves. But in the 50s and 60s, city planners devastated the historically African Rondo neighborhood by building Interstate 94 right through, like just right through the main business district of this community. So through that process, one in every eight Africans in St. Paul lost their home. And there were many, many countless African businesses that were decimated and never reopened because this interstate was just ripped right through their community. So Rondo was a vibrant African community which had grocery stores, schools, churches, libraries, all manner of businesses you could find there. Um, and there was a very high rate of African home ownership as well. And this was just completely destroyed by the interstate being built. And just to look at another neighborhood that's just a couple of miles down the interstate, Prospect Park is another neighborhood that was circumnavigated by Interstate 94. This is a white neighborhood that had connections to politicians and, you know, it organized to save their neighborhood. Um, while just a couple of miles down the interstate, an entire African community was devastated. So white people in Minneapolis have benefited from the history of colonial violence, and we continue to sit on the pedestal of white wealth and African oppression in this city to this day. Uhuru, Uhuru, Leah, I, I really appreciate just laying out all this data and irrefutable fact about the colonial conditions faced by African people in Minneapolis. And I think it's really important for us to understand this because the murder of George Floyd did not happen in a vacuum. And I know we're going to talk more about the, the murders and police terror that goes on against African people every single day and has been for decades in Minneapolis uh, in just a second. But I think the point, the final point that you made in what you were just saying, that when you look at these statistics, you're not just looking at a, a so-called wealth gap or something like that. You're looking at a colonial divide. You're looking at colonialism. You're looking at a colonial relationship between white wealth and progress and African poverty and oppression. One requires the other, as we understand from Chairman Amali Shetela and this whole understanding of the colonial mode of production. So in one way, it is, it is an offensive lie for Minneapolis to promote itself as being this wonderfully progressive place. On the other hand, it is true that it's progressive for white people. And anytime you have a city, I mean, St. Petersburg, Florida is no different. Anytime you have a city that likes to, you know, uh, posture as being a really progressive place for the white population, the conditions of African people are some, and sometimes the worst in those cities of anywhere in the country, because the ability for there to be such a high standard of life for white people requires a deepening a tightening of the noose around the necks of African people and a deepening of, of the terror and colonial uh, oppression and exploitation of African people and indigenous and colonized peoples. So I, I think that, you know, looking at these two realities and understanding that it's actually one reality makes it really clear that there has to be a stand from white people in Minneapolis and everywhere that we exist for reparations to African people, that all white people owe reparations to African people because all white people sit on this pedestal and benefit from this colonial relationship that has existed for hundreds of years. Yeah, yeah, I, I really agree with that, Jesse. And I want to join you in appreciating the research that you've brought us, Leah. 
all the facts that, that you just laid out, the picture you just drew for us, which is familiar to me. I know it's familiar to you, Jesse. It's probably familiar to anyone who's been paying attention, who's listening to this radio show and podcast right now. It's the story of uh, what happened to the gas plant district in Laurel Park here in in St. Petersburg with uh, Tropicana Field. Uh, I know it was the story with the the Gateway Arch, the the black community that was destroyed to build that and many other vibrant, once vibrant African communities that were devastated, that, that were destroyed. Um, so it's, it's not an isolated case. Um, and I also wanted to ask you, you know, you, you recently authored a statement for the Uhuru Solidarity Movement website regarding a report released by the State Department of Human Rights dealing, uh, detailing the police terror against the African community, what Chairman Amalia Chatella has summed up as part of the counterinsurgency colonial war against African people. The world saw the brutal murder of George Floyd in 2020. And a a few years before that, the vicious murder of Philando Castile. And that's just scratching the surface of the colonial terror waged by the police against African people. Could you sum up for us what was in that report? Uh Yes, I would be happy to. So after two years of investigation that was spurred on by the brutal police murder of George Floyd in 2020, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights released a report recently exposing how the Minneapolis Police Department engages in, quote, the illegal practice of race discrimination in violation of the Minnesota Human Rights Act. So this report outlines how oppressive colonial conditions in Minneapolis are maintained for the benefit of the white population through a pattern and practice of police force, stops, searches, arrests, covert social media surveillance, and other violent tactics used to oppress, murder, and control African, indigenous, and colonized peoples. So this unceasingly Genocidal violence is innate to the colonial mode of production, as laid out by Chairman Omalia Chatella. And during a two-year period of January 2020 through February 2022, African, Indigenous, and other colonized populations compromised approximately 42% of the Minneapolis population, but accounted for 93% of police department-related killings. Africans make up 19% of the Minneapolis population, but account for 63% of, quote, use of force by the police department, exemplified by the fact that Minneapolis police use higher rates of chokeholds and chemical irritants on African people when compared with white people. Minneapolis Police Department officers search, cite, arrest, and use force on African people at a rate which the report admits is significantly disproportionate to the size of the Black population in Minneapolis. Minneapolis police officers searched African people or their vehicles almost twice as often as they did white people. And the report discloses that the Minneapolis police utilized, quote, covert social media accounts in an effort to, quote, surveil and engage Black individuals, Black organizations, and elected officials unrelated to criminal activity without a public safety objective. This is a hideous colonial practice. It's a continuation of COINTELPRO and the counterinsurgency designed to keep African people from organizing and fighting for self-determination. So our mayor, Jacob Fry, he feigns horror and disgust at these findings. But the African People's Socialist Party has long maintained that this is how the colonial capitalist system was designed to work, and therefore these findings are not an aberration or a mistake. And in fact, this report sheds light on the true nature of colonial oppression of African indigenous and colonized peoples and the oppression that they experience every day of their life. And it's only getting worse for colonized people in Minneapolis. Recently, it was announced that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and Minnesota State Troopers are joining the Minneapolis police to intensify policing in specific areas of the city. 
And this increase in the number of police is due in part to the large number of Minneapolis police officers that quit the police force following the heroic African-led uprisings in Minneapolis that followed George Floyd's murder. So the mayor talks about this police surge as a way to, quote, bolster public safety. However, we know and we've laid out here that for African, indigenous and colonized people, increased police presence leads to violence, terror and death. So it is clear that this additional, um, you know, this addition of colonial police forces is at the expense of African, indigenous and colonized people. And the only people it is meant to, quote unquote, protect is the white colonizer population of Minneapolis and the surrounding areas. For real. Thank you, Leah. I mean, this is just so outrageous to see this information about what the police are doing to African people in Minneapolis. And, and of course, just so typical of the colonial state that whose, you know, whose purpose is to function as a military occupying army in the African community. And I was just in Minneapolis, as you know, um, you know, organizing with you and others on the USM recruitment organizing tour. And I was really struck by the fact that there are white people who live in Minneapolis who want to do something, who were moved, whose consciousness was impacted by the incredible righteous African resistance that emerged there two years ago, and who are looking for a way to take ongoing meaningful action even when the protests have subsided or the uh, focus of the U.S. ruling class media has shifted elsewhere, as we can see from this report, the conditions have been, have been unceasing. The police budgets have increased. The murders and terror and arrests and beatings and harassment, surveillance of African people has been ongoing. And so too has the resistance. Just because white people don't see it in the streets doesn't mean that African people have not been fighting back every single day. As we know from the work that the African People's Socialist Party is leading around the world, including here in St. Louis, where they're building dual and contending power in their own hands through the Black Power Blueprint and so many other programs. So it was really powerful to be there and just to see the openness of many white people. When we did an outreach table on Sunday, there were white people who literally ran over to us to thank us for being there and to express their excitement and enthusiasm about joining the movement for reparations to African people and the ability, the opportunity to be led by the African working class, because white people are not going to lead this struggle as the ones who have benefited from this colonial relationship for hundreds of years. Uh, our sh opportunist, narrow, short-term material interests are linked with the social system that's built on the backs of African people. The, the interests of African people, the African working class, cannot be realized unless the colonial mode of production is dismantled and overturned and African people are free. And our long-term interests as human beings can actually only be realized in that process as well. So not only is it our responsibility to fight for reparations to African people, to stand in solidarity with African people and the anti-colonial struggle, it's actually in our interests and it's actually our future as well. And the future for all life on the planet Earth is to be found in this struggle. So I was very encouraged by, by the experience there and, and really appreciate and salute you, Leah, the incredible work that you've done raising resources, holding reparations challenge, uh, acupuncture treatments for many years, and just so much other work that you've done to build support and solidarity with the African Revolution uh, there in, in the Twin Cities. And um, yeah, I think, I think that white people who live in Minneapolis, if you're listening to this and you want to do something, you want to get involved, now is the time. Two years since the murder of George Floyd, there has never been a more urgent time than now to get involved and join the Uhuru Solidarity Movement and build unity with the, the struggle of African people for reparations. Wow. Yeah, I, I really agree with that, Jesse. You know, um, I, I think that the, the the question of George Floyd is still very much with us because George Floyd's murder, like the murder of Mike Brown, like the murder of Trayvon Martin, represent uh, a daily reality. What 
what was unusual was that we saw more people thrust into political life in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and and Breonna Taylor and others in the year 2020 than we'd seen historically, I believe, ever in the United States. And it became an international movement. And that uh, reality, that colonial reality, that colonial terror that that uh, movement was waking up to, that, that political energy was confronting is still with us. If anything, as you said earlier, Jesse, the noose has just gotten tighter around the necks of African and indigenous and other colonized people. Leah, I'm wondering if you could talk to us about some of the organizing work that you're doing in Minneapolis and tell us what's next for Uhuru Solidarity Movement in Minneapolis. And if uh, people want more information, how can white people plug into that and or find out more information about how to plug into it? Yes. Well, we just had a very successful USM organizing tour, which Jesse was able to join us for um, in Minneapolis. And it was entitled Unity Through Reparations, How White People Can Support Black Liberation. Um, we were very honored to have Jamal Abagaz of the African People's Socialist Party and Julian Palmer Smith of the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement to join us and give some of the keynote presentations. And of course, along with Chair Jesse, who also gave a presentation, they, you know, these presentations were really moving and powerful. And they called on white people to take up the struggle for reparations as a mean means of repairing the devastation of colonial capitalism, and to do this work under the leadership of the party. And I have to say that the the quantity and quality of political education that USM puts out in the form of webinars and articles and podcasts is just outstanding, but there is nothing that compares to being in person and hearing from, like, just directly from our leadership in the African People's Socialist Party. There is an electric nature to gatherings such as this that is really exciting to be a part of. So, you know, our the people that attended, they were really moved by this, and we won members immediately during the organizing tour and have since laid a stronger groundwork for ongoing reparations work to happen here in Minneapolis. We've got a core group of really committed comrades here and our next task, what we're called to do is to build for the Days of Reparations to African People Speaking Tour that will happen in September of this year. So the Days of Reparations to African People is a massive reparations campaign of USM, and it's combined with a speaking tour, which generally is featuring Chairman O'Malley Ashitala. So if you are a white person living in Minneapolis or St. Paul or any of the surrounding area, and you want to receive more information about the Minneapolis committee that we're forming to build for the Days of Reparations speaking tour, you can send an email to mpls at uhurusolidarity.org. Wow. Thank you so much, Leah. And you know, I, I do want to just uh, come in and, and join the, the information that you're putting out with the, the fact that, you know, George Floyd was murdered by a white cop on May 25th, which is African Liberation Day. And I think it's, it's worth pointing out, you know, as the day of his, the anniversary of his death, his murder approaches, we're also approaching African Liberation Day. 2022, as we record this on May 10th, 2022. And the African People's Socialist Party, which leads the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, is holding celebrations of African Liberation Day um, under the, the title Relentless 50 Years of Leadership Toward African Redemption. On May 28th of this year, 2022, African Liberation Day events will happen in eight different regions throughout the world where the African People's Socialist Party is present. And these include Oakland, California, St. Louis, Missouri, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, London, United Kingdom, Sierra Leone, Africa, um, the Southern Africa region or, or South Africa and the East Africa region. And if you would like more information about these events, you can go to ALDUhuru.org. That's ALDUhuru.org. So I just want to express how profoundly I appreciate your presence on the show today, 
Leah Fifield of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement in Minneapolis, and uh, also to you, Jesse Neville, National Chair of the Uhuru Solidarity Movement located in St. Louis, Missouri. My name is Jamie Simpson. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to White Lies Shattered. We'll see you next time. You're listening to Reparations in Action. Reparations now! This has been an episode of Reparations in Action, the White Lies Shattered series, a biased podcast of white solidarity with black power. My name is Jamie Simpson. This episode was engineered by Marcel Marius, who also composed our theme music. The show is researched and produced by Penny Hess, Jesse Neville, and Lisa Watson from the Black Power 96.3 FM studio in St. Petersburg, Florida. A shout out to Akile Anayi and DJ Eddie Maltzby, as well as the entire Reparations in Action team, Sandra Forrest, Johan Bedingfield, Amanda Carlozzi, Kyle Weiss, Marissa Ricchetti, Ali Aiello, Alana Woods, Declan Keller, Hallie Murray, and Sarah Ritterspock. If you liked what you heard today, you can go to Apple Podcasts and rate this podcast. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, please email them to us at ria at blackpower96.org. Special thanks to the African People's Socialist Party's Chairman Omali Yeshitela, without whose leadership and theory of African internationalism, none of the understandings presented on reparations in action would be possible. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Thank you.